Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. This episode is brought to you by Gainsbox. Gainsbox is a monthly delivery of CrossFit apparel and gear, giving you everything you needed for your workouts at half the cost. If you're the type of person that likes getting the latest fitness gear but hates shopping for it, this is for you. Every box is a mix of apparel, gear, supplements, and snacks that's worth double the cost of what's included in the box. Every box is customized by size and gender, and each is curated by an industry expert. So some of the past boxes have been with people like Scott Panchik, Annie Thor's daughter, Maddie Rogers, and even Brooke Entz. And when Brooke did hers, we collaborated a couple years ago, gave out discounts for programming, um, maybe a t-shirt, all kinds of cool stuff like that. So they are offering listeners of this show a code worth $70. This is a very special offer. When you go to thegainsbox.com, spelled T-H-E-G-A-I-N-Z-B-O-X.com, so it's The Gains Box with a Z, and you sign up for a subscription there with a coupon box, I mean, there will be a coupon box. If you enter in all caps, Brute Strength, you're going to get a special bonus box worth $70 with that first monthly subscription. And I asked them if they would just give us the $70 in cash, and I'm still waiting to hear back. I'll let you guys know. So go to thegainsbox.com to get $70 worth of free gear delivered right to your doorstep. Okay, let's get this show started. Hello, welcome back. This is Michael Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I've got my good friend Tommy Marquez back on the show, also known as T-Mommy. Tommy is a former CrossFit Games analyst. He's been on ESPN, CBS, all of the big networks, and done a phenomenal job in that role. He was one of the team members on the CrossFit Games media staff that was laid off this past year, and he has since started one of the top health and fitness podcasts called Talking Elite Fitness with his partner, Sean Woodland, uh, where, they, where they interview just about any CrossFit Games athlete and big influencer in the sport that you've heard of, as well as have a bunch of like super fun episodes where they just mess around. Um, today, we talk about, we start out by talking about raves and electronic music, of course, and then we talk about his proposal to his now fiance and how she almost kicked the engagement ring off the side of a mountain. And if none of that is interesting to you and you just want to hear about the CrossFit Games or CrossFit, jump to about the 31 minute mark. And he tells the story uh, of getting laid off and everything that went on behind the scenes at CrossFit HQ. Then we talk about the games and sanctionals and where the sport is going. And he has some exciting things to share with you. Tommy is an amazing storyteller and one of the main voices in the sport of fitness. So without further ado, please help me welcome Tommy Marquez. T Mommy. Tommy Marquez. Wait, wait, so wait, why do they call you T Mommy? Oh man. What's um, the story? <laughs> okay. Uh well, uh do you want the full unabated version or you tell me, more? man. Anything okay. goes here, but you know, you have your own reputation to uphold. Oh, okay. Um <laughs> 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 I guess I guess that means anything goes then because there's not much left of that. <laughs> uh, so uh, one of the things I'm very much into is uh, music and in particular live music. So going to music festivals um, for the longest time, it's basically any type of music. But in starting in 2011, 2012, I started going to like really big electronic music festivals as well. And part of that is like you get this big crew to go and you have like your basically like they're raves. So you get like your rave family and there's very much the vibe within that space of like having like a family collective unit, you know, and we all kind of look after each other. But for a lot of our group of friends um, at the time that I was introducing into the scene a little bit, they were still really, really, really new. So everything from just like navigating schedule to, uh, you know, wearing some, 
wearing the right kind of clothes to the event to making sure they're hydrated and take care of themselves at the festival and not doing anything stupid. <laughs> um, I kind of took on the role as like team mom. And I was like the person that was like looking out after everybody. And when everybody's having a good time, making sure everybody drinks plenty of water. And like when everybody's like over the moon, you know, like little things to like make the experience better. Like, you know, you're having a good time dancing, you know, here's a little bite of your favorite, like, candy or something like that <laughs> yes, and yes like um some cool refraction lenses to look at all the like the light shows and everything and i had this big bag of tricks that were like all little ways to kind of enhance the experience and so one of our buddies i believe it was ryan johnston started calling me t mommy instead of tommy um, as like this kind of you know mixing of names because i was like the mom of the group and you know also you know my name's tommy so um so he started calling so me clever. t-mommy and then everybody started calling me that because every time anybody needed anything they'd just come to me right hey do you have chapstick do you have gum do you have <laughs> you know water do you have you know can i have those refraction lenses or like you know can i have the massage glove or anything like that i'm like i got you man so yes. i had this big bag and that's basically how it got started. Yeah, I'm grinning ear to ear right now because I have been uh, on the receiving end of um, many nights of t, t mommy <laughs> taking care of me and making sure I have a great time. Um, yeah, that's awesome, dude. Actually, <clears throat> you know, I, I went through a really hard time in my adolescence and uh, I did a lot of ecstasy and listened to a lot of techno. And so for mm -hmm. the once I got sober, once I went through recovery, I went so long without listening to any electronic music because I thought it was yeah. all, I just associated it with this dark period in my life and you and Marston reintroduced me to it. in I think 2014 and oh, yeah. since then, like I listened to it at work when I'm working out <laughs> like nonstop, man. So I really appreciate it, that. And the beauty, the beauty of it is like, uh, to be honest, like we're kind of in the sweet spot of electronic music where it's like, before it was only there was only like a handful of types, you know, mm -hmm. per se. It's like um, there wasn't the breadth of like styles that's available now is that comes with like a type, particular type of music coming mm -hmm. into the limelight. So back in I remember. So electronic music used to be my study music. It was like really like soft, ephemeral type like house music that mm -hmm. was just steady rhythm. Not a ton of lyrics, maybe a little bit of techno here and there because it was just rhythm based and it just kind of kept me going in the mood like as I'm just like churning through studying and stuff like that. And then the what basically came is the big room house. So it's like the festival style, like really big, like anthem type songs that have these huge drops and ton of production behind them and really kind of get the energy and the like the party going. That started to come into play around 2011, maybe a little bit more than that. But you started to see like Swedish House Mafia and some of these big European DJs that could just sell out arenas and like just have an absolute like amazing experience along with like the lights and everything like mm -hmm. that. And that's what pulled me back into it. And to me, that's where like the, the family style started coming back in and like wanting to bring more people into it. And so like like a lot of people are just like, oh, like house music. It's just like that. Mm -ts, mm -ts, mm -ts, right, mm -ts, right. That's it kind of music. I'm like, oh, no, man, there's so much more to it. You know, there's tropical house. There's, you know, there's there's acid house. There's regionally specific types of music, whether it's techno or drum and bass and like all this other stuff. But it's, it was cool. It was like there was that sweet spot for a little while when we all went to EDC where mm -hmm. I felt like everybody was in it and kind of figuring out their own like vibe that they like from that type of music and that's yes, what indeed. made me really happy yes indeed yeah it, one of the one pleasant surprise about getting into electronic music and going to some of those festivals and a couple you know quote unquote raves was at the best ones people really are are kind and thoughtful to each other very much unlike other festivals like most other festivals and music scenes yeah. and yeah. sure there's a lot of supplementation in the electronic scene uh but even sure. sober people like there's just this culture of like we're 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 here to treat each other well and um feel the connection between us between each other and treat each other like family which was super cool yeah. And I think there's an important distinction there. And like it's something I try to talk about when anybody, anybody asks me about the scene a little bit is I think the differentiation is 
that in some sense instances for other festivals, um, like you said, like there is some supplementation, but I think in general people are already going into that festival. So like from, with a sober mindset of community Mm -hmm. and connectedness, and they already have that as their baseline and their foundation going into it. And then that supplementation is just that it's just adding to the experience or like maybe adding a, an amplifier to it, if you will, versus these versus in other festivals and other situations, at least that I see people are going into it. Like maybe that's not their baseline, but they're trying to use this supplement supplementation to flip it or change their mindset. And that just has like a slightly different effect. And it can be negative or positive and kind of work against you sometimes. That's a so great point. It, it's so the results are very much more different and varied, which is why you get, you know, which why I haven't had that that feeling of connectivity in some of the other festivals that I've gone to. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I mean, substances tend to amplify your personality either up or down. And so it makes sense. Like if you have a, a positive mindset that it, it could really take that to the next level. And if you have a, a negative or just like a a selfish mindset or you just want to get messed up, then you're going to have a much different experience. Yeah, Yeah. totally. So dude, you're getting married. Yes. Tell me the story. Not sure when yet. How'd you do it? Oh man. Okay. So, um, so, uh, my then girlfriend, Tiffany, which you're familiar with, but, um, who I've been dating for mm, upwards of four years now, uh, she just finished graduate school and, We had had this plan for a long time to like not get engaged per se until she was absolutely done with school. Just because one, I I didn't want to add that burden on her, you know, of like having to think about a wedding and all that stuff. Um, And I wanted her to be able to focus on her school entirely. And so the initial plan was we weren't going to get engaged until like 2020, maybe. Uh, But I I started depending on if Trump gets reelected. (laughs) (laughs) well then we're moving to canada Um, (laughs) that's priority uh, just yeah just kidding um but uh it was uh (laughs) oh man that threw me off um but uh we it kind of became clear more and more just in our interactions together that we're kind of like we're like ready for that next stage and it's almost something that we're like kind of yearning for Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I got the sense each time we were together that like, man, we're just like ready to start moving our life and accelerating our life together in that direction. And so back in April, I decided to buy the ring and she had no clue. And I knew that I didn't want to do it on her graduation weekend because that's her weekend. Uh, her, her parents kind of, her mom kind of wanted me to do it that weekend, but I'm like, that's she gets to walk across the stage, get her doctorate in physical therapy. That's like all her. I want, yeah, man. I want, to, I that want is, her to be propped up. That's such a thoughtful, th- like thoughtful response. I like that. And, and, and it's like, she's been working three years, like three plus years for that. You know, it's like, she deserves it. And, um, I witnessed firsthand how much she's worked for it. So it's like, it would be very, very selfish of me to like, want to like insert myself into that, I guess. Mm-hmm. Kind of steal and, the show almost. Yeah. And so I knew that sh- that that weekend wouldn't work. But I also knew that in a couple of weeks after that, she's going to Thailand. And then when she gets back, it's focusing on her test and um, season starts for for me for CrossFit game season. So I was like this next weekend, her parents are uh, planning a quote unquote grad party back home. Mm-hmm. Um just to get family and friends together. And it was really important to me that her great grandma who will be the guest of honor at, at, at our wedding, uh, be there for it Mm -hmm. and be present for that, for that day because she's 95 and is, you know, she's the kind of the matriarch of their family and, um, is very much like still with it at 95 years old. And, I know T- Tiffany really, really values her time with her and they have a very good, strong connection with her. And that wouldn't be able to happen for any other weekend except for that one because I knew she was already coming down. So I organized that with her family a little bit, um, organized it with um, a couple of her friends from grad school who are, she's really close with to have them fly uh, a drive up without telling Tiff and try to organize a few other friends too. And then as far as location, 
there's this hike that Tiff and I have been trying to go on for basically since we started dating. It's in Big Sur. It's uh, it's in Garib Parda State Park. Oh, it's the yes. um, it's the Soberanis Creek Trail, um, which is like probably my favorite hike on the planet. Wow! And it's like I just I just love it. It's like to me, it's like the perfect hike mm-hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. It's uh, it's it's got some like the first part, if you go counterclockwise goes through the, like the woods and the forest and you get the river and like a very woodsy feel. And then you come out up along the ridge line, and it's actually a very difficult portion of the hike. So it's like a good workout. There's some nice sun exposure during the springtime. They have super blooms there. So like thousands of flowers blooming at the same time. And at the top you get like from standing at the top, you can look down to the ocean. You get this beautiful view of the coastline in, in Big Sur. And you look back and you can see Karma Valley, Salinas Valley. And it's like this really neat contrast from just turning in a couple of different directions. Um, and, and it's just, to me, it's just like perfect. It's like quintessential hike that to me characterizes our area, which mm-hmm. is where I grew up, where she grew up. So I thought that would be a really cool tr- hike for us to go on for it to happen because we've been trying to go on it for so long. We haven't. One time we went and it got rained out. Another time we went and the trail was closed for for cleanup. And then the fire the fire happened in Big Sur and it's been closed for three years. Wow. So um, and so it's it's not technically all the way open, mm-hmm. but it is. They're like they left the signs up, but people are hiking it every day, the full loop now. So I was like, all right, this is the we've been trying to go on this forever. I think it would be really cool if we finally get to do it. And like our, our first time hiking it together is this really special moment for us to kind of like hang our hats in and set the tone the rest of the way. And metaphorically speaking, it's like I thought it was kind of cool. You know, it's like this is something we've been working at for so long, for so long, for so long. We finally get to do it. And so I invited a bunch of our friends to come on the hike. Her brother, my brother, uh, Mars and Heber uh, flew out for it because they were coming to her party. Nice. And they're also coming to uh, in quotes, interview some people and just some other friends as well to come on the hike. And since Marcin and Heber are obviously filmmakers, it's very common for them to have cameras out. Yes. And for the, anytime we get somewhere pretty, pretty on a hike, they throw the drone up and start flying it and stuff I think, like that. I think since Marston was like eight years old, he's had a camera with him at all times, all times. And even he, he <clears> probably had a t- fake one when he was little too that wasn't actually recording anything yes. but he was doing it anyway when, whenever um, they put whenever they put out the next uh fittest documentary and they're like famous and shit one one day that that documentary that he put together in high school you know the one i'm oh, talking about yeah yeah oh yeah it's all of his buddies exactly, just acting a fool the exactly. whole time exactly that's gonna oh, come I out i can't say the name of it because it has some joy has some choice <laughs> words on it. i don't want i don't want to be the one to ruin his reputation but it's uh it's hilarious. Yeah. It's actually pretty awesome. Uh, I've that would be hilarious to include in like a in like a a documentary about them too. Yes. Oh man. But yeah. So we uh, so had them come out, which was really cool. And then um, we went on this hike, and the, <laughs> I was actually really worried about what the trail was going to look like because I hadn't been on it in a while. So the Wednesday before, I like uh, called up, you know, Adam, our buddy Adam. Mm-hmm. Um, Adam Peterson and we, me and he met me in Big Sur and we ran the trail together just to like scope it out and time it out and everything like that. Um, and because Tiff was technically back in town, I had to like turn my phone off so she couldn't see where I was, like see that I was actually in Big Sur. It was all this crazy paranoid <laughs> stuff. Not ruin it. And so we got to the hike, um, and we got close to the top. And I had the ring in my backpack the whole time and I had it at the bottom and it was wrapped up in like, th- like a couple shirts and jackets. So uh-huh. there's like no way she would ever look at it. And <laughs> we were taking forever to get to the top because everybody was dying. Oh, like shit. people were like, people were like, oh man, like let's, let's take breaks. Let's take breaks. Let's take breaks. And I'm like, let's just get up here. Cause I'm so damn nervous right. and like worried about it. And Marston and Adam are like giving me shit the whole time on the way up, like don't mess up and like all this stuff and like just amplifying my nervousness. That's hilarious. And so there's two lookout spots at the top and they're both like little rocky ledges, like natural rock formations. And the first one, we're going to take a big group photo, like take a couple photos and then we're going to walk to the next one. 
And then we'd all take another group photo and he would be like, oh, let me get the drone out for this one and get the drone set up. And then Marson would like, like get everyone set up and be like, all right, everybody jump on the count of three. And then when everybody jumps on the count of three, I would kneel down instead and he would start snapping photos, camera would be rolling. So I'd be the only one not jumping and I'd be on a knee and then she'd like, she'd be next to me, obviously seeing it and not know what's up. And then I would propose to her and hopefully get the words out in time. Yeah. And, uh, all of that went relatively without a hitch. Um, we got to the first spot, took a couple of photos. It was good. We got to the next spot, um, got everything set up. And then, but at the first spot I had the, I had transferred the ring to my back pocket and she went to put her hand around me Oh shit! Uh, for the photo. <laughs> and I realized she, I mean, she was maybe an inch from putting her hand on the ring box right. and was was moving towards it and i just grabbed like slapped my basically slapped my own ass <laughs> just, just wrenched my shorts around to bring the ring box around the front and just like totally twerked out my shorts yeah and she was like you're right and i'm like yeah sorry like <laughs> kind of <weird> thing. <laughs> and she's like oh okay and i have like sweating bullets and oh. <laughs> take the photo and then like, i got to put it back I was like, "Oh my God, that was so close!" And so we get we get to the we get to the spot. Everyone on the count of three jump, and everyone jumps on the count of three. And I'm pulling the ring out as I kneel down, and we all had to jump, right? Well, she jumped and like flared her feet out, <laughs> and when she and when she did it, her feet kicked me, <laughs> and ba- and basically ki- kicked my hands while I'm holding the re- ring box, and. I, if I wasn't like gripping it with like a death grip, it would have just gone over my shoulder oh, and fuck. down the cliff. Oh fuck! And so there's a I, I posted some photos to social media, and you can't quite see it, but you see the before and after. So you see me bringing my hands out, and then you see the next photo when her feet have already like kicked my hands and passed, and I've got the ring box pinned to my chest because I'm like, oh my gosh. And she turns around because she kicked me and she's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I wait, what? And then everybody scatters like cockroaches, you know, so we're just front and center. Oh, and shit. She, this is great. And then she and then she says a few choice words and I'm sitting like and my biggest fear was not being able to get any words out because mm-hmm. like, you know, I talk for a living, obviously, and like. It'd be, it'd be kind of funny if like I couldn't actually figure out what I wanted to say. Right. And because she kicked the ring box, I was so worried about the ring box. I I forgot where I was for a split second. I looked up and she's staring at me and I'm speechless now. So I'm like, oh my God, it's happening. I can't speak. I can't speak. And I'm like losing it for a second. And then I kind of like took a quick deep deep breath and she actually like was just like oh shit and like covered her mouth again and that like gave, gave me a, like a half beat to like right. get myself together and actually get the word get the words that i had prepared out and then she like you know said yes and started crying and then i didn't realize this but um adam and danielle had uh stopped and gotten two bottles of champagne on the way to the hike and hike packed them up with them in their backpack and so once they did they like we're shaking them and brought them out and we got to celebrate right there at the top, at the mountaintop. And oh it, it my all ended God. Up great. That is so, amazing. It, yeah. I it, feel like that, that should be a, that's a, like a diamond company video right there. <laughs> and then I gave her my, my Jared's diamond ring. <laughs> <laughs> he, went to, he went to Jared. Uh, Holy it's a, shit. It's a, hell, it's, a, it's a good advertisement for the ring company, but um, yeah, it was, and it, and it all ended up working out perfectly. She had no idea. And she was actually a little, like, not really pissed, but she was, like, a little pissed that I caught her off guard. Uh-huh. Like, almost like, I gotcha. That's you know? hilarious, man. She had no idea whatsoever. She thought I didn't have the ring. Right. And she was, like, t- telling all of her family members, like, her family members are like, oh, you guys going to get engaged soon? Knowing that we were gonna, this was going to happen. Right. And she's like, oh, no, he's, like, he's so busy and he doesn't have the ring yet. And then yeah, she, yeah. like. Like, damn it, you got me. And uh, then we came home and all our family was there. And, every, and, we, and we we basically had a, a big party at her parents' house and ate and played games and drinks were flowing. And it was just our, our families, like my family came out and it was just like everybody had such a good time together. And it was like an awesome, 
awesome way to kind of close it out. That's awesome, brother. What a great story. And yeah. I'm just so excited for both of you. Um, y'all have a, an adorable relationship. You're, you're very playful with each other. You seem so, so supportive of everything that the other wants to do. Uh, I'm curious, what's, what's one of the biggest mistakes that you've made in your relationship so far? And what did you learn from it? Um, mm -hmm. and I, I'll give you some time to think and I'll, I'll be vulnerable and share one myself. Sure. Whenever, uh, a D and I sort of not, not well, not first got together, but about a year in, we got married and we were dealing with all of this immigration stuff. And mm -hmm. at the time, and, and it's very, there's, there's a ton of paperwork and working with lawyers and it is really, it can be really overwhelming the amount of stuff you have to put together. And at the time, for some reason, I just thought I, I saw it as her issue, like something that she had to do on her own. And she mm -hmm. tried to get me to help her. And I kept, I kept making her wrong over and over and over for asking me to even like participate in that process. Mm -hmm. And it was already like one of the scariest situations of her entire life. And yeah. I was just being so, so selfish. And we had our, by far our biggest fights in our relationship were over that. And at some point, um, I just got really clear about how her moving to the States was just as much my issue as hers. And then, um, I really took responsibility from there and it was, you know, then it was all mm -hmm. good, but that was, that was a huge mistake. And what yeah. I learned, what I learned from it was, um, really like i just want to be the type of person that it, it doesn't even have to be my issue i just want to take care of my woman right and i want to mm -hmm. take care of my future kids and i want to be the uh, a supportive man uh, and i just want to take responsibility for everything in my life and it was a real push for me in terms of like masculinity and just stepping up to the plate regardless of whether or not like w regardless of who's uh job it was you know mm -hmm. yeah um it's interesting I'm, I'm like i think there's a couple things that i think have been like i, I would say have been my biggest mistakes that i'm still kind of working through mm -hmm. um one i'm really hyper competitive um yes, you and are. yes you are <laughs> and like from everything down to like you know trying to you know be the best analyst to, from a work perspective to like wanting to just destroy the other team like blood sweat and tears in a game of spike ball you yes. know it's like um i have a hard time turning that off at at times almost and and it's it sounds weird but it almost bleeds over in some ways into what like if we have a disagreement not necessarily like a fight but like a disagreement over something and we're like figuring it out i have a hard time turning off of turning off of that like cutthroat competitiveness mm -hmm. mentality so mm -hmm. like if if i'm right i i'm not right in the in the best way you Got know it's it. almost like like i i i'm right in a and and tiff will tell you this too like it's like i can't be i can't be right and have it be a positive for both of us it's almost like i'm right you're wrong Got like it. that's the, the battle lines are drawn and you need to know it kind of deal right and it's, uh, it's, it's definitely something that I've had to work on and I'm still not great at it, but, um, it's, it's one of those things where it's just, actually, it's funny that you mentioned it. Cause we, we had a moment this morning actually, cause she was, she was here and we we're having breakfast together and kind of talking through some things and we're going through our calendars together and she, the roles were reversed in a situation where like where she was, she was right. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely wrong and I realized it and she realized it and I like couldn't do anything but laugh. Mm -hmm. And I was like, holy shit, I see it from your side now. Yeah. Like this is how I am to you. And I don't like it at all. But right. my reaction was just to laugh, but I had to fight. I didn't want to laugh because I didn't want to like <laughs> trivialize it, you know? Right, right. So I was fighting back this laugh and it, I made this really weird face that like <laughs> actually actually made it worse you know like just expression and um so it was kind of like this uh i, I this process that i'm still kind of working through you know mm -hmm. i guess the other 
the other thing I, I think my biggest can I make a comment on that yeah I think I think the the awareness of that being an issue for you is like the the most fundamental answer to the problem like for anyone listening like as soon as we become aware of a problem that we have as soon as we become aware of our ego at play it immediately starts to dissolve and if we talk about like 80 20 principle like the things that have the biggest impact awareness yeah. of problems is by far the biggest impact yeah and and, and I'll, I'll be the first to say i owe that awareness to tiffany specifically like for her having the for her having the like being being able to almost kind of dissect the situation and being able to present it in a respectful way that mm-hmm. helps me understand it and see it better is that's like that's like I owe that to her because right. of it because part of that the part of the the nature of that that situation or that that shortcoming is that when I draw those battle lines I become closed off to everything else so it's hard for me to see those things and she's been able to kind of like chip away at it and help me see it a little bit more. Um, but yeah. And like the, the, the other thing I think is, uh, more so tone, the tone I take sometimes. Mm. Um, and I don't realize it as much. Um, there, and this kind of piggybacks off of this last one. I think they're kind of, uh, they go hand in hand is even like whether I'm right or wrong, that how I say things and the tone that I use them can greatly affect our ability to both find a reasonable solution and compromise and move forward together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think my the the bleed over of that of that competitiveness and that like me wanting to like you know always be either all, someone's always 100% right or someone's always 100% wrong right. um, puts me into this mood or uh, I guess I don't know maybe reactionary stage where my tone without me realizing it sometimes is is just toxic to the situation totally. and, um, um, and that's that's definitely something um, I, I still need to work on and I think it's something that me and me and Tiff are working on now actively now that we're more physically in the same place at the same right, time right right, right. and you get more repetition and it's yeah and that's something we haven't had the luxury of having for the last few years is we haven't been in the same place you know we've been long distance and um but it's it's definitely like I feel like we're something something we're getting better at. That's awesome, bro. Yeah, yeah like I said, um, I really look up to your relationship, and um, I yeah I love how playful you guys are and how supportive you are. So I knew there must be some gold there. <laughs> I'm very I'm very fortunate. I'm uh, I'm very much a big kid on the inside, mm-hmm. and I think I think Tiff is too, and I think that um, our the best way I can put it is our big kids are best friends on the playgrounds. So like we, you know, we know we're, we're still learning how to be the best adults we can together. Mm -hmm. But I think we, the, the the aspect of being playful and, 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 and being able to have fun together is something that we, that we naturally, that naturally gravitated towards each other like from the get go. Oh, that's huge, man. Hey, just a quick reminder, if you want some free shit from the Gainsbox, and I know you like free shit, go to thegainsbox.com and enter code BRUTESTRENGTH in all caps, and you're going to get $70 worth of free shit in a special bonus box. Let's get back to the show. So I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, I want to go back to a bit of a challenging time. Uh, About a year and a half ago, you had, you went through quite a transformation. You had by all external measures, like the dream job in the dream location for the dream company. You're playing spike ball with your boys. You're skateboarding in between uh, offices at CrossFit HQ. And then mm-hmm. at some point, things started to change. Um, they started yeah. to let people go. Who were who the first, what was like the first apartment where they let people go from? Um, so typically, so, and, and this is, so just to, to kind of preface, like we'd had cuts in the past with CrossFit, um, previously before this whole kind of, uh, I don't know, this calling happened, but, um, it was, there was all, it was always clearly communicated and there was always some clear reasoning behind it. Um, and then last year, right around the games, we're coming off of what I would consider an all time high point for us. Um, you know, the, the games were from a production standpoint were a fantastic success. Mm -hmm. We had, 
more live hours on CBS, the biggest television network in the country. Um, they wanted more. Our streaming numbers with Facebook were doing great. And Facebook wanted more from us. Um, and I felt like as, as, a, as a media team, we were really hitting our stride. Like this is what we had been working for for like the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. um, and then the first round of layoffs happened right after the games. Uh, and typically we're a little staff heavy after the games because we need to, we need it. And, but those are a little bit more seasonal. And so some of the cuts made sense, but, uh, in that round of cuts, my brother was included. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, I ended up, I'm going to walk my brother out of the office and, you know, um, which was very difficult for me and him along with a handful of other people didn't really make sense. Um, as to why we were cutting back, like yeah. maybe, maybe they, they were, they needed to make cuts financially, but it didn't seem like the, the company was in a tough financial spot. Um, and then the mood started to change. So we, 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 we lost some people, we lost some of the, like the lower level positions across the board in our broadcast, like in-house media team, some people from social, social media, um, some people from. Um, basically all different corners of the company mm -hmm. uh, from the company in general or just the games the crossfade games from the games and the media department so like it i think there were some people from i like the web development and it it. Uh, there's people some social media so i think a, a writer or two um i wasn't there's a lot of people outside of the office so i wasn't really sure about that but the cuts were relatively small and then we uh we had a meeting after those cuts, a, a company wide meeting and you could tell the mood had changed. Like everybody was tense because the cuts weren't communicated to us. Um, it kind of came out of the blue and, um, a lot of our friends were gone yeah. suddenly and including my brother. And we had this meeting where everyone got together and the executives got together and it was supposed to be like an open forum, like, hey, this is what's happening. This is why it's happening. Um, and some time for us to ask questions. Uh, Greg got up and spoke for a little bit, just kind of talking about what his vision for the company was. But it was honestly the same thing that we had heard the last three times he had spoken. Right. So I think a lot of people were With tuned like CrossFit out. CrossFit health and everything. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, we've got the most elegant solution to the world's most ve vexing problem. Um, this is what we want to do. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all, we're all on board with that. Like we, we know, um, we, this, we really want to know what's, what's going on. And, you know, he finished with like, Hey, like you're all a part of our team. Are you all on board with this direction? And we're like, yeah, we are. He goes, all right, you know, like, let's go get some tacos or something like that. Cause they were having lunch catered. But then this, the COO at the time got up and was kind of open form questions and Sean Woodland, you know, my, my partner in the podcast was like, Hey, do we need to brush up on our resumes? Like, is this going to be something that's going to be continuing? Um, we're all adults here. We love working for this company and we love the, we want, we all want to be a part of this direction, but if there's something that we're not being included in and we need to know, like now would be the time to tell us, mm -hmm. um, we're going to, we'll still do our job. We'll still work hard and do all the things that we need to do, but we just want to know what, where things are going. And we were told at that time that no, nothing else was changing. Everyone else was part of the, the plan going forward. Um, and a little, about a month later, um, we, and so I, I should say this in that, in the meantime, after that, everybody was walking around on eggshells. Mm. What was normally a vibrant and, um, really kind of fulfilling place to work with everybody really with so much like passion and creativity kind of flowing through mm -hmm. was replaced by uncertainty, um, nervousness, fear, um, a lot of people have been like, Hey, like, is this, are we done here? Like, is this, is this going to happen? What's going on? Right. Because what started happening <clears throat> is other outside media outlets were starting to report on changes in the company that were happening to the company and us before we knew it. Right. Podcast and YouTube channels and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so basically Greg and the executives were talking to everyone except for us. Right. And it felt like we were getting cut out of the table in terms of information being released to us. And so that's when everybody kind of 
looking back now, hindsight being what it is, like it, it was it was this telltale sign that like we weren't we weren't viewed as part of the family anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's like a pretty hard pill to swallow, you know? It's like, um, I liken it to like, right after you get broken up with, and you're kind of like in denial a little bit, and you're like processing it, that month felt like denial about us like eventually getting let go. Mm -hmm. Like, no, no, they wouldn't do that. Like, we're doing all this other stuff. And at the time, we were, my team was working on CBS shows, so we were pretty em embroiled in a big project. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, October, the weekend of October 13th and 14th, um, Marston was out of town. He was in Brazil. Um, and a handful of us had gotten together that weekend to work out at the, at the HQ gym on a Sunday. We'd, we'd usually do something fun on a Sunday. And I had this weird, and I've told this story before, but I had this weird, like, instinctual feeling that, like, something was wrong. And I'm, I'm there and... Um, we finished working out and I'm like, Hey guys, I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to start cleaning out my office. And they're like, what are you doing? What are you talking about? I was like, I don't know. Like maybe I just need to tidy up or something like that. But I just had this weird feeling like I'm just going to like clean up and like arrange my stuff and maybe take some stuff home. And, um, I organized a box full of stuff and like really minimalized my office at the, at that time. Mm -hmm. And I'm coming down with the box and I left my phone downstairs and, um, one other person in the gym with us had like a ghost look on her face. Like, like she had just seen a ghost and I'm like, what's going on? She's like, check your email. Did you get the email? Oh, I'm like, what are you talking about? And I open up my phone and they just sent out the round of emails from HR saying, Hey, you, uh, you have a meeting with us tomorrow morning. It's mm -hmm. a mandatory meeting. Um, like, please be there on time. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then quickly everyone started sending text messages. Hey, did you get the email? Did you get the email? And we realized that they were all staggered in like 15 minute increments, you know? So it's like, okay, we're all getting let go. Right. Um, Damn. Yeah. Um, and so it was like, I knew it, I knew it. And so like, I just took my stuff to the car and I kind of like went home and, yeah. uh, just kind of like, you know, whatever, do whatever you can. And with, in that type of mindset, mm -hmm. uh, I reached out to a couple of people, a couple of the, a couple of people in the leadership group in the company asking them like, Hey, is this what I think it was to which legally I don't think they could respond because, and they didn't. Um, and then walked into, to, uh, the office that Monday and got laid off. Um, and was told that, um, yeah, the company was headed in a new direction and that my job was being removed. And, uh, they handed me payout for my time that I'd accrued. They paid out, paid out my, um, my time off and they mm -hmm. gave us a, a, a severance and peace. Wow. You know? Wow. So it's, it's especially crazy. <clears throat> it's, it, it feel it seems like a really, really rich person all of a sudden going bankrupt. Like you guys, I, I know how much you loved your job and how much of your energy and your passion you poured into it. Um, and how much they at, at one time supported you and, and made of an course. incredible work environment. And then yeah. for them to, for it to end that way is, yeah. is really weird and crazy. It, it felt like, uh, I don't know. It felt like an episode of the twilight zone, you know, mm -hmm. or like a bad dream. It's like, no, this is like not how it's supposed to end. You know, mm -hmm. like two months ago where we were on, we're finishing up the games on CBS and everybody's like riding a high and like looking forward to the future. And like, um, we were always told um, by our our superiors in, in the games department and by Greg himself that like, hey, what we're building here is a family and we're building we're building a community and an environment of people, hardworking people that are passionate. And I want all of you guys to retire from here. I want you guys to see this as a lifelong pursuit, like just like health and fitness are lifelong pursuits. I want you guys to view your work here as a lifelong pursuit and I want you to feel comfortable knowing that this is the type of job that you can retire from. And that was always pushed on us. Wow. Always, always, always pushed on us. And, uh, so it felt, it just didn't, it felt weird, you know, it just didn't feel right. Um, and then I felt bad for Marston cause he got laid off while he was in Brazil. So they called him and, and laid him off. Um, so it was kind of a, a wild and, and then like, you know, and then w it was all done. And yeah. just like that, just like that, I was out of a job and, um, all the plans we had for the next season and all the, 
stuff we had worked for and was just not gone, but it was just not, not there anymore. Abruptly and, uh, done. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we were left with a lot of questions. My team in particular was given uh, staggered final dates. So some people were laid off on the spot. Some people were given a final date at the beginning of November. Some people were giving, given final dates at the beginning of December um, because we had these projects that were still done. We still had to finish. Um, I was laid off immediately. My portion, my, my portion of the project, the project we were working on was done. So, um, I was laid off and it was, it was, it was tough because then a bunch of my coworkers and friends had to turn around and continue to go to work knowing that they were laid off. Um, so it's like, Hey, we're going to cut you in December, but you still got to come to work the next, you know, six weeks, Right. which I guess. You know, in talking with people, it's a little bit more common and what you see, you know, in the in the corporate world and stuff like that. But CrossFit was never never operated like that. Mm-hmm. So it felt very if it, it felt like a very cutthroat business way of handling things from a company that wasn't cu- a cutthroat business. Right. Uh, so it, it was uh, it definitely took some time to process. And it was uh, yeah, it was tough. It was like I felt like my world had gotten flipped. Totally, man. I can't imagine that. Uh, I have a couple of follow-up questions. What, what do Greg's words mean to you now? Like the, the whole thing about family, what do you make of that now? Um, like if he sold, if he told me that same thing, Mm, just in retrospect, like he's, he said that repeatedly and then in the end treated you this way. And and it's not like he treated you a certain way, but you know, he has, obviously he has a lot of influence. Um, I think like, well, in, in retrospect, his words have, are, are absent of meaning, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, they don't really mean anything to me anymore. Um, in that regard, cause, uh, yeah, that's tough. Um, especially because, uh, I, there was a clear differentiation between uh, and a clear contrast between what he was saying and what what the company was doing, um, and it, it very much felt like a person that was afraid to tell us the honest truth to our face, mm-hmm. so would much rather say stick to like these nice, happy feely, grandiose ideal ideal ethos of the company. And, and like stick to that rather than actually like, Hey, this is what's actually going on. And like handle the, the, I don't want to say dirty work, you know, because it's just, it makes it sound like it's a, it's a mistake, but it's, um, just instead of actually, honest, right. Like yeah. having, a, having the tough conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, he didn't want to have the tough conversation with us. And all of those, all of these changes were clearly laid out ahead of time. Like when they were talking to us, like they knew that this is the direction that it was going and this is all going to happen. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's just like, um, it's just, it's just like the, those, those words just kind of, they, they just don't, they don't hold up. They don't hold water to me anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I, st- I still think, I, I, th- I still think that those words might have value to the people that are still on the inside mm-hmm. and are in that inner circle, you know, but it's just like, um, to, I, I just, I don't, one of the things that bothers me the most, with, just in general with people, is people being two-facedness and people openly lying. Um, that doesn't sit well with me. Sure. And and um, that that applies to this situation as well. And I just felt like I was deceived. Yeah. Um, it's like, hey, listen, we 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 busted our asses for you, um, and we we poured our hearts into the things that we did for you. Um, the least you could do is be honest and have a real conversation with us. And, um, shoot us straight, you know, yeah. we're all adults. Um, so it, it was, uh, it definitely see how, how things that reframed how I view, view things and view certain people as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. So I don't want to belabor why, like why they did what they did or, um, any of that, but sure. I, I do want to, I want to fast forward. Um, first off, I really appreciate your honesty and openness about that whole thing. I know it was so hard. I remember talking to you a few months later and, um, it just being this like brand new, super scary 
uh, <laughs> experience, right? Like you, yeah. oh, you yeah. didn't think you were having to go back out into the job market and be an yeah. entrepreneur and do all of these, these things, you know, um, fast forward and you have one of the top podcasts in all of health and fitness. Uh, people are flying you out to put on, put on, uh, tracking watches and speak at events and <laughs> all kinds of shit. And, uh, you're, you're making shit happen, man. You're succeeding and you Thank are you. really, really seizing the opportunities that are opening up. Uh, so how are you, how are you feeling right now in your career? Well, first off, thank you. Uh, those are very kind words. Um, I don't, and I'll say, for, I don't always feel like I'm seizing that opportunity. And I think uh, maybe it's the nature of of the entrepreneurial role is you're all that that you, there's that just a little bit of sliver of like, am I making the most of this, and am I am I making the right decisions, and am I, am I doing everything that I can to mm-hmm. maximize what I can be doing right now, um, and that. That always, uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say that, always kind of sits in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say there was, early on, there was, if I had to give it a number, it was like like 80% of the time was uncertainty and a little bit of fear and a little nervousness about where the direction was going, with about 20% being like, you know, excitement and optimism and, and hope for what could be. And then slowly those scales kind of tip a little bit more. And I would say it's more the other direction, 80, 20, the other direction. Mm-hmm. So there's moments of, um, a gratitude for what I've, what has been able to develop over the last year. Um, um, and, and the opportunities that I've, I've been, I've been granted. Um, there's some um, excitement over the potential for what we could be continue to build going forward as well. And, um, yeah. And, and then still that little bit of nervousness about like, is, am what I built am is, is what I'm building permanent is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is what I'm building permanent enough and st- strong enough to stand on its own. Cause I think, um, I think that's one of the things that's one of the lasting effects of this layoff, right. Um, is a, how, how vulnerable I felt afterwards mm-hmm. because we were so, confident that what we were doing mattered to the company mm-hmm. and mattered to the powers that be and was like something and we're that was something that we're going to continue to do it was just like oh yeah like there's no doubt that in five years we're still going to be doing this there's no doubt that in five years we're going to be working for crossfit and do all of that so it almost made us maybe we're a little bit too confident in that mm-hmm. and and it didn't and it, it allowed for the 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 acts to kind of sneak up behind us um but i think that still worries me a little bit. So I'm like, well, I felt so confident in what I was doing at CrossFit and I still ended up on the cur on the, on the, on the kick to the curb anyways. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how can I make sure that what I'm doing now I'm safeguarding myself at least to an extent from that happening again, Totally. like from, um, from one person's decision just to wipe out everything that I've built. Right. And so I I think that's, that's a big source of, the uncertainty and nervousness for me now, but it occupies a much smaller portion of, of, of how I operate on a day to day. Totally, man. Yeah. I think that's a very wise uh, approach and perspective. Like we always want to kind of diversify and protect ourselves against the worst case happening. And Mm -hmm. I'll offer a, a, a bit of a reframe. I think you can almost expect for the rug to be pulled out from under you mm-hmm. at some point. And so it mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense to prepare as such. Like at some point, this yeah. whatever I'm working on now is going to change, right? Like mm-hmm. who knows? I too, like podcasts might like that, that whole p- uh, type of technology could go away in an instant, um, like other forms of technology have. At some point, everything is going to change in every part of our lives. So yeah, we have to, we have to just make sure that we're continuing to build skills and capabilities. And the one huge plus side for you in this whole thing is that you had a ton of incentive and pressure and support in building such a great skill set. Like I remember seeing you in your first year versus now speaking and, and, uh, being on television and it's, it's like two different people, man. You're a complete, <laughs> like per, you're, you're just a professional and one of the best I've ever seen. So now you can take that into any industry. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. And 
um, I was, well, I was very fortunate that I had people that were very supportive of what I wanted to do. Um, and honestly it was a, and this is, and this is the, the one thing where too, I have to be still be very grateful to, to CrossFit and all the powers that be there because, um, I was provided an environment that allowed me to flourish too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's one thing for me to want to, to, to improve and do better. Um, but there were a ton of people that were brought, brought together that were around me that really, again, amplified that. So, um, it's, um, and I guess this is kind of circling back a little bit. Um, when you ask me about what Greg's words about family, um, mean now, mm-hmm. I, I, I would definitely have to correct the record a little bit there. Cause I, I feel like they mean much, they mean much less obviously, mm-hmm. but at, there was a time when it meant more and that mean that interpretation of family for him built a te- helped build a team that made me very happy and successful. So I yeah. guess that's like, um, I, I still want to hold some appreciation for that, I guess. Yeah. I respect that. And also yeah. did, uh, y'all did a lot of good in the world and you made, uh, Crunchy. fucking inspiring and entertaining content and things of that nature. We so, tried to. Yeah, man. <laughs> so you talked about, um, quote unquote, like what, what I'm building right now. What are you building? What are y'all building? So, for, so right now, um, Sean and I are continue, continuing to build our podcast into um, basically being one of the reliable voices within the community to help guide fans and um, athletes, coaches within the sport to understand just what's going on on a day-to-day basis. So um, one of the biggest holes that there's been from a media standpoint is – a reliable voice that people are accustomed to making that they can go to day like week in and week out and know that they're getting the quality information. Um, and that's one of the things that we've wanted to do because Sean and I always felt that, um, with, through our work at CrossFit and, and covering the sport, we were able to provide a platform that highlights amazing human beings doing amazing things. Uh, and, and that in turn inspires other people to be better. And, the podcast pl- platform has allowed us to do that under a different format. So we want to continue to build that out so we can a reach more people B provide a wider range of content so that if maybe for someone the podcast might not be their favorite format, they might scour YouTube. So mm-hmm. we want to build, we want to hopefully build out some video components and build out our YouTube channel a little bit more, um, and do a lot of things that can a bring the production quality up. Cause mm-hmm. I feel like people deserve that. Um, allow us to focus a more of our, more of our time on the podcast. So the breadth of information and the detail and the analysis can get better. Mm -hmm. And, um, also like just have a good time too, because like the sport is fun. Like people enjoy the sport. There's a reason why I got to, to where it was and with, you know, half a million people signing up for the open and, um, you know, Facebook wanting to, sign a multi-year deal with CrossFit because of the reliability of its streaming numbers and the engagement of the people on its platform. So we want to be able to continue to foster that community because I think it has secondary and tertiary effects on the remainder of CrossFit as well. And through that continues to help people as well. I love it. dude. I just had this, uh, and y'all are already doing a phenomenal job. It looks like y'all have like three episodes a week right now. Uh, close to it. Yeah. So we do our, we do a weekly, like, our flagship show. Mm-hmm. And then we usually mix in a couple of, uh, interviews, uh, with people as well Two, two, one to two interviews a week. So anywhere from two to three episodes a week, which, uh, yeah. And, and on top of that, we're trying to continue to build out our ability to go and do, uh, um, and this is kind of continuing that last question, um, our ability to go out and support the sanction events. Right. So I think that's been a bigger focus. It's going to be a bigger focus for us this year. So whether that's through our podcast being there in person mm-hmm. or through us working for those events through, you know, as contractors and stuff like that, being able to support the the ecosystem on a, on a regular basis in a way that, that allows everybody to, to kind of flourish. Because I feel like we, at our core, we want the sport and the community su- to succeed. Um, I think there's benefits across the board for that, whether, you know, the powers that be CrossFit at CrossFit agree or not for everyone involved, for the affiliate community, for the underserved fitness and health wise to, uh, you know, to the youth and future athletes and, and fitness people of tomorrow. Um, 
And so part of that is making sure that this new system succeeds. Mm -hmm. Um, um, in the, in despite of the fact that this system is what replaced us right, right. <laughs> kind of, you know, um, so we're trying to figure out ways that we can go be a, of service and help to people for these sanction events. Cause there's a lot of events that have an idea of what they want to do, but not how that, how they want to do it in mm-hmm. terms of media. Like hey, every event wants to, you know, have a high quality production. Every event wants to get eyeballs on their event. Everybody, every event wants to make sure that they're providing top quality media across the board to help their event succeed and want people to be a part of it, but they don't necessarily know how to do that. Right. So, um, one of the benefits is, uh, of not just me and Sean, but like a ton of our former coworkers at CrossFit have is, is being able to build that firsthand. Right. And so we're trying to support those events and, um, do our best to kind of like, I don't know, I don't want to say give back, but it's kind of like giving back to the system, I guess, and, and support it as much as possible. That's badass, dude. And yeah. it sounds, it sounds I'm sure there's a, a level of fun to like building things from the ground up. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I know in CrossFit, like y'all, y'all specialized a lot, but you got to mm-hmm. see the entire process. So now you get to participate in a lot more of those uh, moving pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and that's, that's equal parts exciting and scary too totally. now because uh, it's very, it was very easy to be in our silo for a little bit, you know, and then like look back and be like, Oh, look at the finished product. And now you have to wear a lot more hats and it's a lot more stress, but it's fun. It's I really it. fun. I love it. Um, I had this funny idea. You were talking about like having fun on the podcast. It would be a great, a great little segment on the show to do like phone, phone, a guru or phone, a gene, uh, uh, phone a yeah phone a guru and then you call marston and he's like dressed up as a genie and he answers his, <laughs> his, his iphone and he's like you ask him for like advice on something <laughs> he's just a genie with like a crystal ball right yes <laughs> we've been I, 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 one of these days, I, it's, it's an idea we've had for the longest time we've always wanted to do dispatches for mars and it just have yes. like have marston weigh in on things and just he's but he's always doing something different so he'll be like all right like for another edition of dispatches from mars and he's over there like he's like fixing a bird bath or like <laughs> he's like he's like i don't know he's like skinning a deer he's always doing something different that's yeah. like completely random because it kind of fits his personality but that's definitely like we want to add some more that's like that's, a, that's the other thing. Like we had a good time when we did what, like, I think us having a good time is what resonates with people yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, and an example of that is we did a CrossFit WrestleMania episode for our podcast. Oh, Sean, shit. Sean and I are huge pro wrestling fans. Uh-huh. Uh, and almost like we're, 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 me and Sean and I are both big nerds. We love, we love pro wrestling. We love comic books and stuff like that. And, um, star Wars and all those things. And we did this CrossFit WrestleMania because it was an idea that we used to have back at HQ. Every year at HQ when Wrestle, WrestleMania would come by, me, Sean, and a couple other people who like wrestling at the office would build out a WrestleMania card using all the people from our office, using our coworkers. Uh-huh. And it would be hilarious. And we'd write the storylines. It was just like a fun thing to do, fun thing to do. So like, I don't know how familiar with wrestling you are, but there's a Money in the Bank ladder match. So inside this gold briefcase that says money in the bank, there's an, a guaranteed shot at the, at the, the like title. the heavyweight championship, okay. at the title. Yeah. But it's a ladder match for all these people trying to get it. And so we would have every year we would have the, the intern slash production assistant money in the bank ladder match. So all the people that we hired that year as interns or as production assistants that were like bottom of the bottom of the rung, at least they would all have a ladder match to see who could get a full-time contract to work at headquarters. So like we would like tie it in. Amazing. So we built out this full WrestleMania card this year, just between games athletes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we did it for fun and we thought, all right, we're going to post it. Nobody's going to like it because it's so in the weeds into wrestling, but everyone loved it. People who didn't like wrestling were sending us results and, (laughs) and all this stuff and, and it ended up being one – it's to this day one of our most popular episodes. Wow. Just because we had such a good time recording that episode and people recognized that and in turn res- res- that resonated with them and made them want to get involved too. So we right. had – we had at the end of the episode, we asked people to send us how they would have the final match between Tia, Katrin, and Annie, the triple threat for the women's title end. And they had to include finishing moves and nicknames and all this stuff. And we got 
almost a thousand responses no on shit. DM from wow. people like being like, I don't follow wrestling, but I'm going to do this because this is awesome. So that's gold, uh, man. That was a, a clue early on for us to like, A, do the things that we love and have a good time and then work that into what we like to do as well with CrossFit and fitness and the mm-hmm. greater vision of our podcast. And that's another medium for us to access people as well, yes, you know, a way yes. to kind of, um, I don't know, build a relationship with them. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot to learn in this department. Like people, they, they, they really want to enjoy themselves and you know me like in person, I joke around as much as anyone as on, on the podcast. I'm like, Mr. Serious for some reason. And I'm, I'm slowly like crawling out of that, that part of myself, crawling out of that part of myself. I'm, I'm, I'm slowly taking steps in that direction, but, um, yeah, man, people want to enjoy themselves. And so you're just, you're just helping them like learn something or educate them, or they're just laughing their asses off. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's the thing. Like people, people can learn a little bit like, well, it's just like, yeah, I don't know. Like it's like you, if you had, it's like if you had this meal, right? If you just had a plate full of vegetables, right. it'd be a pretty boring meal, right? right? But you have like steak and all the, your protein and all these other things that kind of make the full complement of things. And, you know, maybe you have a little dessert in there every once in a while and it, you know, keeps you happy and keeps you like, I feel like those episodes like that are a little bit of the dessert for us. Yes. And, and it keeps it and it just satisfies the sweet tooth enough for people for them to like have a good time and then still be more receptive versus just constantly you know, beating them down with information and getting a little bit monotonous, but yeah, that's um, a great perspective. Actually. I like that. Um, but yeah, you got, you got to work on getting that out, out because there's no one I'm more, uh, I say this with the most as a, as a complimentary thing. There's no one I'm, no, uh, there's no one I'm more cautious around language wise in terms of like sniffing out jokes and like sarcasticness <laughs> than I am with you because you'll say some things and I'm like, it registers. I'm like, wait a second. He's, he's this like, bait. Yeah, this is bait or like you're, you're BSing <laughs> me right now or something like that. You're like, you do such a good job of disguising it. Like we'll be in a conversation and you'd be like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, add to the conversation and everybody just kind of goes along with it. And then it like one by one clicks in everybody's head <laughs> that that Mike's just messing with us. And <laughs> it's awesome. It's fantastic. And I think it's a, a very important part of who you are. So. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think part of the reason is at least the story I tell myself is that a big part of my sense of humor is extremely raunchy and I'm not sure, uh, I have the enough time to show people that I'm actually a good person, um, the, to like balance out the raunchiness. I don't want yeah, them to yeah. ever just hear that, but I'm working on it. Yeah. You titrate out little tidbits. Here. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It is funny. I like, I think every single episode on this show is, is explicit content, like, <laughs> like labeled as explicit material or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've had one yet on our podcast. Actually. Wow. Wow. It's a, that's actually, it's a weird, uh, it's a carryover for us from, from, uh, our time at the update show and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Um, because, and it's not because we don't, use explicit language or anything like that, or that we're like way too uptight to ever do that. Curse. I've heard it. Yeah. <laughs> <My own ears. laughs> but, uh, it's, it's interesting though for like, for us, for the me, for what we're trying to accomplish in the medium that we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think it's a, a good, a good analogy. And I think this came from Nicole Carroll about why she doesn't curse at level ones. Mm-hmm. She was like, basically like, if I don't curse at level ones, I know I'm not going to put anyone off. But if I, if I curse, I know I run the risk of putting a couple people off. Yeah. And now my message is falling on fewer ears. Mm-hmm. So it comes down to what do I value more? Being able to curse at a level one or, and this is a, this is a total rough as, um, a paraphrasing yeah. of what she said, um, or reaching as many people as possible. Right. Um, and so I think for the podcast in that medium, it's like, we want to reach as many people as possible. Um, and I like, I like the idea of like people being able to be like, Hey, like I got my, me and my kids listen to this every weekend. I'm like, that's cool. That's really cool. You know, like I like that a lot. And, um, and then, you know, if you meet me in person, you might hear some, some choice language, I guess, but, uh, you know, all for all in good fun and appropriate, I guess. 
but uh so yeah i think it's kind of a decision that we we kind of made for what fits best with the message and and the the thing we're trying to accomplish i guess totally that's another thing i'm trying to learn that what i hear is i i listen to this with my kids all the time and then uh several times throughout the show i have to uh really quickly turn the volume down (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or I can't, I can't listen to my, to this with my kids anymore or, or when they're around. So, uh, I want, I want to, uh, to learn from your example and from Nicole's example. Yeah. I mean, I, but it's also like, if you feel like you're, you're sacrificing a little bit of, of the core of who you are, then, mm-hmm. then maybe, uh, maybe that's not the thing you want to do. Cause sure. I mean, for me, for me and Sean, it's almost second nature because of what we had to do at CrossFit and right. keep it and like keep it clean there. So it's not really much different for us, I guess. Um, but at the same time, it's like could be a could be a good parenting lesson for those people, right? You know, right? Like, hey, they're gonna hear hey, this. This is a word. There. This is a word that mommy and daddy use, right? But <laughs> but not you. <laughs> but yeah. So who knows? Yeah. Do you have ten more minutes? I got all the time in the world for you, man. Love it, dude. Let's talk CrossFit Games before we get out of here. Sure. Um, sure. So. I want to know what the consensus is about this past year's uh, CrossFit Games. And from, I'll just say, from my perspective, from a purely, um, like, pretty objective, removed spectator perspective, it was by far the most exciting CrossFit Games I've ever seen because of the cuts and everything. Um, Like, the media coverage was what it was. But in terms of the actual <laughs> events and competition, um, it was awesome. So what, yeah. what were your, what are your thoughts on how, how this went? And let's start there. Um, I, first off, I wish everyone could see your face when you said the media coverage was what it was. <laughs> um, I think, I, I think actually there was some really, okay, this is, this is in general kind of my view of the games. I said there's some really bright spots and some things that give me hope for the future. Mm -hmm. And I think we can really hang our hat on and build on going forward. And I think there's some things that clearly need to be amended and need to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. Um, But I not it it all comes down to whether or not they will be. So the I don't know if I'd say this is the most exciting games ever for me. Um, I think the cuts added to some of the drama, but. And I guess this is maybe where I have to put my analyst hat on. Mm-hmm. Um, do we like sports for the sake of drama or do we like sports for the efficacy of what they're trying to accomplish? You know, mm-hmm. so like um, drama for the sake of drama doesn't doesn't really do it for me if it's mm-hmm. if it's manufactured, you know, and I'm not saying that this year is manufactured at all. Um, uh, I do want to throw in the mix that Fraser, just as a talking point, Fraser was like, not in first going into the last event or wow. something like that. So I want to add that as like one of those exciting pieces. Sure. So, uh, and here's a, a little tidbit for you. Had we been under the old scoring system and the old, the way things were in the past, mm-hmm. he would have been on first place from the middle of Saturday on. Wow. So he, wow. that, that flip flop would not have happened. That flip flop was exclusive. That makes a lot to, of sense to was that, that those flip flops and those adjustments were made possible by the cut system. Got it. Um, um, the podium wouldn't have changed, but mm-hmm. the point spread would have changed a little bit. Um, Fraser Bell would have won by a little bit more, but I think you know, we have to, uh, if we want to take a, a real hard look at this, you have to examine why, w- why was it so exciting, right? Well, maybe because Fraser has wiped the floor with people in the past and that as a result, people got tired of the, of seeing him just dominate and they mm-hmm. wanted to see someone come up. Mm-hmm. So maybe this. Um, whether or not it was justified or not, they just wanted to see Fraser get pushed a little bit and see how that happens. Um, so I think the the stage was kind of set for people wanting to see something like that. Um, whether or not, regardless of whether or not it was a valid test, I think you could have had a completely invalid test of fitness, but had the sim- similar results and people have been like, wow, that was exciting. That was awesome. Just right. because we saw someone who's not getting used to, that's a good just, point. Just, just because of contrast, you know, that's a good point. Um, whereas on the other side of things, we saw a Fraser-esque performance from Tia Toomey. She won right. by the largest margin of victory ever, and no one's talking about that, right? It's just because it was different than what we're used to seeing. Yeah. The roles were flip-flopped, that it was suddenly much more exciting. Mm-hmm. It's like the women's competition has been fantastic the last few years. Yep. The finish between Tia and Kara two years ago, the the finish between Laura and, uh, and Tia, even though Tia won, Laura pushing her to the end on the final events, those are fantastic. 
I mean, those that that, that finish between T, T and Cara was like some of the best sports I've yeah. ever seen. And but we we have we we have a very short memory in that regard. I feel like when it comes to live sports, mm-hmm. um, and I think just by virtue of things being different, um, every it made it a, maybe stand out a little bit more in people's minds. But I do think there's some really cool things. I w- I'm not a huge fan of lowering the barrier to entry to get to the CrossFit Games and thus necessarily diluting the meaning of being a games athlete, mm-hmm. which s- some people take that as you don't like the national champion spots. I do like the national champion spots, but I think there could be a threshold there that adds a little bit more to the prestige of being a games athlete mm-hmm. because it's something that deserves that right. for the hard work and people put in while still allowing for more people to be represented at the CrossFit games based on region, based on country, based on ethnicity, based on even religion and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you have a wider ar- array of people at the games that people can identify with. I think that's important as well for the mm-hmm. growth of the sport. Um, but I don't think just inviting everyone to the party is, is the, is the answer to that. Right. But I think I, but I do think there's some really cool things with, with the way I, th- I just, honestly, my fix for that would just be make it, um, if you're a national champion and you finish like at a threshold barrier for, it, if you finish within the top, I don't know, 3000 worldwide, you get to come to the games or something like mm-hmm. that. That way there's some also incentive for improvement. Um, I think when you, when you put that carrot out there and I think it'll, right. it'll help drive the growth and, and, and success of those communities, um, a little bit faster. I think, um, I think there has to be cuts with a larger field, obviously. It just has to happen because you can't go with like that many people throughout the, the games. Mm-hmm. But I think the execution of the cuts could be different. And that's something that CrossFit has already announced that they're changing. Mm-hmm. So the cuts, cut structure will change. Um, I think cutting down to 10 so early on was a mistake. Um, um, just because I felt like there was some people that I think had a legitimate potential claim to be one of the 10 fittest on earth got cut a little bit short as a result. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would have liked to see them have the opportunity to finish the competition because part of our definition of fitness is that over time, as we have more and more tests, the results become much more and more true. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is as true for the top 10 as it is the top one. And the goal is to find the fittest. Right. But I think the, the claim of fittest is reinforced by having a better top 10 as well. Mm-hmm. If that Great makes point. sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, Cause you're usually, yeah, you're going to compare the, the top whatever the top three top five top ten to the top one and the stronger those top whatever you're comparing the the, yeah. the more um significant number one seems sure and um <clears throat> and, and also because they're like pretty frankly put like people's livelihoods are centered around this right mm-hmm. a top 10 finish at the games can drastically alter someone's year financially and training wise and so i think for the test to be a better more accurate representation of that is uh is would be a better service to these athletes and the people that are driving the sport so um but yeah i i but i did like like i love seeing the opening ceremonies with all the different flags out there that was fantastic but like i mentioned there's ways to adjust that to make it more more competitive Mm -hmm. um i do think that over time the sanctionals process is going to be awesome I'm really excited to see all these different communities and pockets take competition into their own hands mm-hmm. and really make it their own, um, which is why Sean and I have made an effort to support those things. Um, I think I think the looming cut line is a cool idea to some extent. I just think we have to be really precise with how we use it. Yeah, uh, It does add some drama. Um, and I think um, I mentioned this before in one of our podcasts – Taking a look at the programming as a whole for the games, I liked it, mm-hmm. but where, when, and where it was applied, I had some issues with. Right, right. Uh, and and th- that's the thing. Normally, I don't have to worry about when and where it's applied because normally everybody gets to do every event. Yep. Right. Yep. So um, by virtue, I have to wait to criticize or analyze until the entire. I know the entire story. Yeah. But when you cut the off at certain checkpoints, you're we're required to kind of analyze up until that point. So mm-hmm. I, I think there could be some adjustments there. Um, but yeah, um, I thought the media had bright bright spots too. I think the fact that it was broadcast in more languages yeah. than ever was awesome. I mean, there was French, there was uh, Portuguese, there was Spanish, there was um, French-Canadian French, you know, yes. like uh, – 
um, you know, on top of English, on top of multiple English broadcasts, on top of um, I'm trying to think all there the was different. There's only one real English broadcast, though. Which one? I think the Morning Chalk Up. Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me. I was like, uh, say, I'm not going to tell you which one I was I know, on. I know. No. Um, I was I was happy with what we did, um, given like our resources and some of the limitations that we had. Yeah. Um, I was also really impressed with what Rogue, Rogue crushed it. Yeah. Rogue did an awesome job for sure. Uh, they uh, like I think it's really cool that and we took very different approaches to it. Right. Um, Rogue had the Iron Game and they had a really well produ- produced set um, with Sean and um, Dan and Annie and Chase, like who are all fantastic. Um, and then we had like our morning chalk up show, which was we had a little bit we had some like a little bit more relaxed set. You know, we had like couches and stuff like that. And it wasn't as formal like of a news desk, um, had some interviews and people coming on and, and packages and things like that. Um, but I thought both of them were great. And I think the fact that both of them can exist now is a fantastic mm-hmm. thing. Um, so I was really happy in that regard. Like um, I was happy that. Um, I was given the opportunity to work with Morning Chalk Up on that broadcast. I was happy that Sean got to work for 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 Rogue, and some of my friends got to work on Rogue as well. Um, and I I thought it was really cool that um, there were more languages than ever. Uh, people got, more people got to hear the CrossFit Games commentated in their native language than ever before. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that we just stop here, because I think there's a lot of improvements within those those um, I guess within those guidelines that that can be made both in the production quality and how things are executed and things like that. But, um, those are some of the big takeaways at least I got from, from the games this year. Um, and, and like I had as much fun at the CrossFit games as I've ever had this year. Wow. Um, and that was primarily because, and this is, I felt like, and this is, I, I don't want to sound selfish or anything like that, but I felt like myself, Heber and Marston did a really good job of uh, against anything else doing things on our terms this year. Mm -hmm. So it was like we were basically given this this the situation now where like we didn't know if we're going to go to the games or not or if we're going to have a role there. And you're like, you know what, we're going to make sure that we're there and we're going to do it on our terms and we're going to create something that we want to do and we're going to do it our way. Mm-hmm. Like we're going to rent an RV and we're going to go travel around and record podcasts and vlog episodes and interviews and we're going to go like live in the RV for the week at the campground. We're going to mix it up with people. And we're going to like meet, like interact face to face with people and like uh, for me it's it was very invigorating in terms of like filling my cup up from a mm-hmm. community perspective i really value interpersonal communication um it was one of the things that i studied in college and um it was the reason why i got into mental health services in the first place because mm-hmm. of the the face to face interactions and the way they affect change in that regard i like communicating with you interpersonally as well ah, likewise <laughs> <laughs> there there's that there's that little cast <laughs> Like, just like, is that a digger at me or not? That, <laughs> there you go. There it is. Uh, and, and so I, I just, I just felt like from that regard, like was, it's the most exhausted I've ever been at the games. It's the least amount of sleep I've ever gotten at the games. Um, but when I look back and all the people we got to talk to and hang out with and meet, um, getting to like, I love grinding. I love being in the thick of things and like having our head down and like really working, like, regionals back in the day and the games back in the day and like those moments of like like we're this is like our super bowl or like our playoff system like from a sports perspective like and it like this it's all or nothing here i love those moments when you're just like you finally pick your head up after just working nonstop for a week and you're like yeah we did that you know we were like standing side by side in the trenches and got after it Mm -hmm. um and i felt like i got that mixed with a ton of like face-to-face time with a lot of really cool people that I wouldn't necessarily get in the past because we were so locked off, um, in, in our silos and yeah, it made for a really unique experience. Now I just wish that we could recapture some of the excitement and fervor and communication of the game's past and couple that with this format too. So, but I think we will eventually. Um, um, I just hope that the community is, is, you know, still behind it at that point. Right. Right. Are there any, is there anything 
kind of going on behind the scenes that you know of sanctional wise games wise that uh, listeners would find interesting? Hmm. Let's see. Um, it's tough because I'd have to, I'd have to think to make sure I'm not like revealing anything that's like, I'm not supposed to, Ooh, that's uh, tough. That's now, tough. uh, <laughs> well, I, I one, I think more than ever, you're going to see a much more concerted effort between sanctionals to work, and you're already seeing it, to work together as a unit. Wow. I think a lot more sanction events are recognizing that if we operate as 28 independent events, this isn't going to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and realizing that we can all kind of, uh, I guess, what's the, the phrase, like a rising tide raises all ships. So if we want this tide, tide to raise, we got to work together to make sure it boosts everyone up. Mm-hmm. and like, uh, and that we can work together to create this a more cohesive uh, a season front to back. And I think that's really cool. I think that's really encouraging that a lot of these events are talking to each other and working together to try and make this season make a little bit more sense from a, a fan perspective, from an athlete perspective, um, to make it more accessible. So um, that that is going to mean more comp- competition opportunities for athletes ranging from the elite to like the formerly regional athletes than ever before. Um, f- a fun fact, just from the uh, sanctionals that are using the open as their qualifier this year, there's more spots available to compete than there were um, sanctional spots before the, and that's not even counting the events that aren't using the open. So right. like if you're just going to do the open this year, there's more opportunity to turn your open scores into a, a potential spot at one of these sanctionals um, as like your de facto regionals than there was in the past. Right. Um, so I think there's a lot more opportunity on the board for people. Um, and I, the, the sanctionals recognize this. Um, I don't know how, if that's like super, super exciting for people, but for, it is for me because like from a, a 10,000 foot view, like seeing everybody work together more, um, it gives me faith and hope that uh, we're going to iron out like the best practice for this thing. And we're going to make sure this thing stays afloat and keeps, mm-hmm. keeps driving forward. Which is which is what people want. Totally, you know? man. Uh, it was so it was such a bummer. Like and, and I haven't I haven't been like like super into the games in a really long time, but every single year when it comes around, I pay attention to all of the media that comes out, the social media posts, the videos, the uh, the road to regionals and you know, no matter, no matter what I'm doing, I've dropped what I'm, I drop what I'm doing and I go to the games and I have an amazing time. And this year yeah. it was a huge bummer. There was zero media. Le- well, not zero media. There's very little media leading up to the event. And it was just, yeah. uh, it felt like a ghost town a little bit. So to he- like hearing this, it's like, we're, we're doing everything we can to get it back to where it was. And some, and, which I think for every former and current fan is, really that's really exciting yeah and 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 one of the things that almost maybe a word of caution for those people is that i feel like and i think even everyone at at, uh, hq for crossfit would say this as well that if the growth of the sport and the growth of the ecosystem in that regard is going to happen outside of the outside of the realm of crossfit hq right because they don't think they are not concerned with that anymore right they want it. They're concerned with with the health initiative and helping the underserved and focusing on that side of things. So I think that puts a lot, a lot more of the onus on everybody outside of the inner circle at headquarters, and knowing that those people are are like the people that the responsibility has fallen to now are dedicated and actively working together is exciting for me. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think. There was something else that that was like kind of exciting for me that. Oh, well, yeah, Marston and Heber getting to do their documentary. Yes. So I'm really excited for that. Um, one, of, one of the biggest bummers from, and it's so funny, almost maybe more so than losing my job, was the fact that I was bummed out that Mars and Heber didn't get to make their movie the, for, for the previous games. Right. <laughs> because um, one of the things, I don't know if everyone's necessarily like keen to, but like with time and more time and attention as with anything you get better at the at your craft right Mm -hmm. and i feel like mars mars heber mariah moore ian wittenberg who who built the documentaries in the past were getting really really good at figuring out the best way to 
put together these these documentaries. Yeah. Um, if you look at the first first fittest on Earth compared to the last one, it's like, man, that one's so much better. Um, even though the first one was amazing when it came out right. too. Um, and so I was really excited for what they had in 2018 because they had they just from the get go they had a better idea of what they wanted to accomplish and how they were going to do it, and I felt like they executed on it fantastically. And those stories that felt like deserved to be told. And then the unfortunate byproduct of everyone getting let go was that, um, you know, some of the, some of the people at HQ didn't want another documentary to be made. Right. So they don't want to pay for it uh, anymore. Um, and they just, or they just don't like it. Right. True. <laughs> um, it's not their, it's not their cup of tea and which is fine. And so this year, knowing that they're going to be able to get to do, make their documentary on their own terms, mm-hmm. um, it's, I was actually in the car. We were on the road to the games in the car, and this may be giving away too much. When they got the call, basically figuring out that their their doc was going to get funded and they were going to be able to do it. And, man, I was almost in tears. Like, And I, they were almost too. It was weird. We were about to go, we were about to go work out with Annie, Bjorkvin, Ake and a bunch of the Icelandic crew, Freddie, uh, and a bunch of like the training plan crew. And the call came and it was like the air got sucked out of the room, but in a good way, like, oh crap, this yeah. is really happening. You know, it's just awesome. And it's like, I got to share that moment slightly with, you know, two of my closest friends and see something that they've been working so hard for, for the last like eight months come together. Yep. So now I hope, I hope people are just excited as I am to see that happen because They've been crushing it, too, with their vlogs and everything like yep. that um, and get to make their movie on their own terms. Yeah. For those of you listening, that's the Buttery Bros. Um, and in the past, they've they've been a part of putting together uh, like two or three or four of the top documentaries on all of iTunes, of yeah. all movies, all genres. And now... Uh, you know, they lost their jobs as well. And now they get this deal to do the documentary under their own names, which is just incredible, just incredible for their, for their careers. And, um, yeah, it's going to be awesome, man. Yeah. They, uh, I think all, I want to say they made five movies. So the Froning doc, which was Heber's Mm -hmm. project. Um, and then the fittest on earth, I think they made four. Sorry. If you hear a dog barking in the background, that's, um, that's Luke. Um, oh, this is so funny. Otis is sitting right here. He can hear, he can hear them, him barking from uh, through my really? headphones. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> oh, Odie. Uh, it's a good dog right there. Um, oh, boy. And all of them, I think, I think it's four, or maybe five. All of them are on the top. Um, it used to be top 50. I think one of them slipped down and it's in the top 100. Best, yeah, like you said, best-selling documentaries of all time on iTunes. I don't think anyone, I don't think any other like filmmaker, producer can say that. Maybe there's a couple that have three, but they've got, they had five. That's crazy, um, man. Which is pretty awesome, and um, they hopefully get to make another one to add to it now. So incredible. Yeah, and and this movie will help build momentum for what they've got planned for this upcoming season, which I'm not going to give anything away about it. But from what I hear, is going to be freaking awesome. They've got a really cool idea and a really cool documentary that they want to do. Amazing! And so I can't wait, dude. Yeah, but well, brother, yeah. we yeah. did it. We did it. Yeah. You're the man. I'm so oh, excited no. for you in this uh, in this next chapter of your life, dude. So many yeah. amazing things going on for you. Yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, um, I will. I will. Uh, I will defer to my 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 friend and somewhat of a mentor Matt O'Keefe he said uh said he said something that was very uplifting somewhere around December November last year he said um he's like you don't know it yet but this this what happened to you at HQ is going to be the best decision like of your life and I was like hmm and he's he's right (laughs) yeah it's more and more he's right yes but it's up, to, but I do feel the responsibility for me to, it's up to me to continue to make that true. Yeah. So, oh, it's but. beautiful, man. That's so funny. You say that as you were talking about, um, like sanctionals working together and how that's going to be huge. I had this image of Matt O'Keefe as, um, like King of the North <laughs> <laughs> for oh, Matt absolutely. O'Keefe, first of his name, King of the North. Oh yeah. Just Protector. running the show, man. Oh Yes. 
protector of the seven realms, king of the Andals. Yep. Yeah, uh, Chief Keef. He's uh, yeah. The, him and the Loud Live crew. They're going to be one of the people that really help drive this thing forward, and they're doing a great job. So, um, but yeah, that's so funny. I just pictured him like one of the North, like the big like fur coats. Yes, uh, yes, he would look hilarious. Yes. Oh man, that's awesome, dude. Where can uh, people uh, hear all of your content? consume all of that delicious content and uh hear more from you oh yeah so uh you can look up talking elite fitness we're on um i mean spotify itunes podcast google play market basically anywhere you get your our heart radio anywhere you get your podcasts uh talking elite fitness you can find us on instagram at talking elite fitness we just our website just launched um talking elite fitness.com um um, we got merch there. We got all. We got links to our episodes there. You can you can find the direct link to whatever platform you follow along with to access our podcast there. Um, we're going to be building out our YouTube channel under Talking Elite Fitness hopefully in the next couple of months here. Um, personally, at Tommy Marquez for my own individual stuff. And then um, yeah, uh, you, any if you, any of you guys subscribe to the Morning Chalk Up um, as a newsletter, I'm one of the regular contributors there. Um, one of their staff writers. So. Um, I'm always writing and keeping the, the skills sharp with them as well. What's your, uh, what's your beeper number Ooh. for those interested? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I had something clever, like something that actually spelled out something funny with letters and numbers, you know, that you remember, you remember like in uh, grade school, you had the calculator and you'd like do this calculation and you yeah. flip the calculator upside down. It would say boobies. Yes. Like I felt like I had something the equivalent of that for like the, the, the phone number, but pager number is pretty clever. Damn. Well, think about it. And if you think of something <laughs> clever, we'll put it in the show notes, guys. You can get those at BruceStrengthTraining.com. Tommy, yeah. you the man. Later. Likewise, man. Always good talking to you. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.